Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about how the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis became the Calvin cycle. And this is actually pretty intuitive to understand if you can understand the techniques that are involved. So I'm going to outline the three techniques, improvements in apparatus around this time that Mr. Calvin came up with this idea uh, and figured out what the products of the Calvin cycle were and the sequence so that he could actually draw this thing. I mean, it didn't, he didn't call it the Calvin cycle. People named it that afterwards after he discovered it. So three techniques really briefly. If you're seeing this after having studied a lot of stuff from the syllabus already, some of these techniques will be relatively familiar to you. But I'll try to go through briefly and make sure you understand. So one technique is called radioactive labeling. So we've seen this with the Hershey and Chase experiment. We've seen this with the Meselson and Stahl experiment and many other places as well too. In this case, uh, you can use radioisotopes to label organic compounds and you can detect the radioisotopes and that's why it makes it very easy. It's like adding a tag to something and then throwing away that something and then you can find that something later because of the tag, right? It's like you're trying to figure out who is stealing your cookies so you put some invisible paint, uh, some glow-in-the-dark paint on the cookies and then somebody goes and eats all your cookies. Later you turn on a black light and you see you know your one friend who has a glowing mouth and you know that that person stole all your cookies. So same idea here. You can use carbon-14. The normal type of isotope for carbon is called carbon-12. So carbon-14 is a little bit heavier and you can actually detect it. So you can put this kind of radioactive carbon into regular molecules like carbon dioxide or hydrogen carbonate ions and then you can kind of see where these molecules end up to figure out how they're being used. Very clever stuff. Then there's something called chromatography which you've seen probably before where you drop uh, put a little drop of some mixture onto some filter paper or chromatography paper. You put it just a little bit of the edge into a liquid solvent and as the liquid starts moving up because the paper is made out of cellulose and has, has tree-like substances in there, the liquid will start to move up and when it moves up it'll separate this stuff out. But this is called double way. So after it's moved you turn this paper sideways and you put it into another solvent and then these things that have just been separated get separated in another other dimension very clever and so you can separate things that things out even further you use to separate small organic compounds run two solvents perpendicular that's just turning the paper 90 degrees and so you separate out all the mixtures one more time separate out the dots one more time that means you can get even greater separation of the actual products and we're going to see how this has been applied in Calvin's famous experiments in a second. And one last way to, uh, one last technique or improvement in apparatus which is necessary for Calvin to carry out his experiments is auto radiography. And this is just a fancy name for saying figure out a way to be able to see the radio isotopes. So you're basically using uh, like film and because this stuff, this carbon-14 gives off a little bit of radiation, if you put some photo photosensitive film here, it can actually detect the radiation that's coming off and then you can actually see the patterns. So combine these three things, use radioisotopes, separate a bunch of things out that contain the radioisotopes and then take a picture of it using auto radiography, you can get, you can actually visualize what's actually happening here because otherwise you can't actually see the products being showed up here. So number three, auto radiography is using this x-ray film to be able to see the actual radioisotopes that were given off by the carbon-14. So um, yeah, these are the three techniques that were used to explain to help Calvin carry out his experiments, which I'm going to show you right now. So what he did was he placed some photosynthesizing organisms, in this case uh, chlorella, into some kind of glass vessel. Here's the famous picture of his experiment into a glass vessel and he shined a big light at it. Uh, big light to give light for photosynthesis and he said, hey little chlorella guys, just do your thing and do photosynthesis. He gave them plenty of carbon dioxide as a raw material for doing photosynthesis and he gave them a lot of uh, hydro hydrogen carbonate ions to help them with their process as well too. And he decided, I am now going to give them the heavier version of carbon. So what he did was he made sure that the only carbon dioxide that was going in there and the only hydrogen carbonate ions that were going in there were actually containing C14 because he wanted to see 
where the carbon 14 was going to end up and you know does it just all magically convert into glucose at once or are there other things that are being produced in between that's what he wanted to figure out so what he did was after everything had the carbon 14 in it he just said hey little guys now you have carbon 14 do your photosynthesis and what he did was stopped them from photosynthesizing. Actually, didn't stop the entire thing. He just let them stay in here photosynthesizing, and then he take a sample. I don't know, maybe every five to ten seconds. So he took a sample, five seconds, labeled that one, five second one, and he would instantly add some methanol inside to kill everything and stop any more photosynthesis happening. Because if you took a sample and just let it sit, then that wouldn't really be a five second sample because the stuff would still keep photosynthesizing, and now it'd just be as long as he left it there. So. In slow motion, he said, start. The experiment began. After five seconds of photosynthesis, he took a sample and he killed it, froze it, moved that aside and labeled that as five seconds. After 20 seconds passed, he took out another sample, added something to kill that sample, labeled that the 20 second sample, put that aside and continued doing this. And for each one of these, now he had a solution and he used the different techniques to try and label everything, use the two-way paper chromatography and then he actually checked uh, with auto radiography to try to see what was going on and he ended up with images that look like this from the five second sample after exposed to uh, the x-ray film this is the picture that he got he got these little smudges that were showing up in little places these smudges have been labeled in this particular diagram but these are the smudges so just take a look at this imagine you're him the first picture you get after five seconds looks like this the next picture you get after 30 seconds looks like this. Your mind is exploding because you thought before that carbon dioxide possibly just turned into glucose magically. But now you're seeing all of these different sized molecules that contain the carbon-14. The only place you put carbon-14 in was with carbon dioxide and hydrogen carbonates, the raw materials that were used for his photosynthesis experiments. So how could this carbon-14 now exist in so many different molecules? Furthermore, not only did it tell him that there were tons of other molecules that were incorporating the C14, he figured out by comparing this simple diagram to this one that whatever this blob was here was one of the first molecules that was being produced in the process between 5 and 30 seconds. And then here the blob is actually bigger. So it tells me that in the conversion of this stuff to glucose, whatever is making this blob is one of the first intermediate compounds that's being made. And that my friends, is the thing. It's on here. It's called PGA. In our syllabus, we call it glycerate 3 phosphate. And when you have to draw your Calvin cycle out, a glycerate 3 phosphate is one of the first intermediates that you have to know about. And then one of the others is triose phosphate. And the triose phosphate gets turned back into RUBP, or it can be condensed with other TP molecules to turn into glucose and then into starch by growing bigger. So this is the reason. He is the reason. These techniques are the reason. All of this is the reason why we have to study the Calvin cycle now with photosynthesis and understand that this first molecule is one of the main intermediates in the Calvin cycle in the conversion of carbon dioxide into glucose. This process of photosynthesis that is so necessary for all of life to exist. And then later on, they discovered a whole bunch of other things, eventually used other techniques to identify the structures of these actual compounds and gave them all names. So that's why we have to focus on glycerate 3-phosphate and triose phosphate. If you study this in college, you'll learn about the many other intermediates that are between these and after these as well too. But for our purposes now, this is good enough to allow us to get a significant picture of what's going on. So I kind of like in this new syllabus where they really asked uh, students to kind of understand um, the basis of these experiments. I mean, for the past 10 years when I've been teaching photosynthesis, never once have we really explained uh, the real details behind these techniques and we just gave this guy Calvin his credit, but now he deserves a lot more credit because students can start to understand the processes that were being used. So think about that next time you're planning an experiment and uh, making your next new life-changing discovery.